Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, we do thank you, Lord, that we carry the torch, but you light the fire, Lord. Father God, we do run to you tonight in the name of Jesus. Father, let us run as one voice, carrying one word, and let it be that word of truth that transforms all circumstances, all people, and all nations. In Jesus' name, amen. And I thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, for those of you who are here for the first time, this is the third Friday of the month, and we do have somewhat of a schedule here. The first Friday of the month is always the head of the month, at which time we deliver prophetic words for the month and for the season. Second Friday of the month, anything can happen. It could be any topic. Third Friday of the month is devoted to speaking primarily about the word and about the prophetic. The um, fourth Friday of the month is always miracles. So if you need a miracle, you want to be here on the fourth Friday of the month. When there is a fifth Friday of the month, it's devoted to healing and deliverance. So you want to take note of that. If there are issues you have in healing and deliverance, show up on the fifth Friday of the month. Amen. Well, I, I'm excited. I'm incredibly excited after the praise and worship because we could look around at what just happened in France and our hearts and our prayers do go out to everybody in France, in Nice. We could look at what's going on in Turkey as of 6 o'clock tonight it seems like almost every hour something is going on and the enemy is trying to have a heyday. And what I hear the Lord saying is the enemy is desperate. The enemy has become desperate. And we're seeing the enemy's desperation because the people of God are in a season of awakening and being more highly anointed, receiving the gifts of the supernatural. There's a new wave of the prophetic. So... We, the enemy may be in a season of desperation, but we are in a season of celebration as the Lord Jesus Christ comes alive in greater measure inside of us. Amen? Well, you look around, and I think it's very clear from praise and worship tonight, God does not want us to be oppressed by evil. He does not want us as the people of God to lose hope. He does not want us to look around at the circumstance and to feel overwhelmed and become immobilized in our spiritual gifting by what's going on in the world. He does not want us to feel hopeless and helpless, and we do not, because God is rising inside of us in greater measure. We're energized by what God's doing on top of what the enemy is doing. Amen? Amen. Well, I was sharing with um, a friend just before the start of the service that a couple of weeks ago, I guess it was, I don't know why I was thinking this, but I was thinking about golf. I used to play golf, or I played at golf at the very least. And I don't know why I was thinking about this, but a thought occurred to me in the middle of nowhere, and I could hear my instructor saying, your stance is important. Watch your stance. You know, get yourself set the way you need to be set. And I could hear in my head my instructor saying, let the club do the work. You know, you're working too hard at this. You know, it's not about what you can do with the club. Let the club do the work. And right on the heels of when I heard my instructor saying, let the club do the work, I heard the Lord say, let the word do the work. Let his written word, let his prophetic word do the work through us as we help to establish God's kingdom. And I heard him say, let the word, the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ, let the word rule. So if we will let the word work inside of us, relax in this a little bit, and let Jesus rule, then we're going to wake up a whole lot faster, and we're going to be moving in power and authority a whole lot more quickly. Amen? So I am not discouraged by what is going on in the world right now. I am encouraged by what's going on in the spiritual realm. Amen? And I think some of the reason that we 
feel a little overwhelmed at times is because we are so astutely aware that this is time for God's kingdom to be established on earth, and we are to be a part of that. We have a role in that, and we haven't quite figured out all of what that role is, and when we don't have things quite figured out, we stress just a little bit about how to get our feet right, what to do with the club, how to do whatever, and it becomes a little bit of a stressor to us. But we have been called to rule and we have been called to reign. Just a couple quick refreshers before we move on. Romans 5.17 tells us that we shall reign by one Christ Jesus. And we don't reign without power and we don't reign without authority. We are so gifted and we are so enabled and we are so spiritually capable and our capacity for spiritual things is so much greater than we've been able to realize because it wasn't yet time for us to realize what our capacity was. But now is that time. And God is opening up our spirits to receive so much more than we were capable of receiving in the past. So no demon in hell, no enemy, no circumstance, no force that comes against us, no loss of job, no division, no, no continued racism activity is God's going to cause us to bow our heads to anybody but the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our purpose for being filled, for being active, Romans 9, 17 tells us that for this purpose, God's raised us up, that I might show my power in you and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. So we've had a measure of power, but more power is coming. Amen? Amen. We know that we're joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So if Jesus gets dominion, we get dominion. If Jesus gets authority, we get authority. If Jesus reigns with power, we reign with power. If Jesus gets the victory, we get the victory. We like Jesus. We've already won. We're just plowing through the circumstances. Amen? <clears throat> In ruling and reigning, we walk not just as sons and daughters of the Almighty God. We walk as kings and priests, as we know by the word. And as kings, we're also ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to be and we need to be in this critical time ambassadors of truth. 1 Corinthians 6, 2, and 3 says that the saints of the church will judge the word in the future. And that's talking futuristically, but it, the verse goes on to say, if we'll be judging the world... And angels, how much more shall we rule over things that pertain to us right now? Right now. Now, how many of you have circumstances right now that are oppressing you? How many of you have circumstances that are a distraction to you right now? Well, let me tell you right now that we are rulers with the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have power and authority over those circumstances. So right now, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, God, that you're sending forth your authority and your power and your anointing, and by that, Lord, we break the, any distraction come against your people tonight in the name of Jesus. We break any oppression over them in Jesus' name. We break any, uh, any um, circumstances that inhibit them from receiving all that you have for them right now in the name of Jesus. Right now, we declare victory over every circumstance for everyone in this room in Jesus' name. Amen. Because your word says that we can in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Second Peter 2.9 tells us that we're a chosen generation and a royal priesthood. Just further confirming that we're not just worshipers, but we have authority and we have power and we co-labor and we co-rule with the one great king, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm going to tell you that I've been spending, I don't know why, but I've been spending a lot of time in the Old Testament lately reading about kings. And um, 
I'm not going to go through everything that I've been reading, but I do want to summarize a couple key points that I think are significant to us even today, because even though it was a different time, there's so much that we can learn by looking at the kings in the Old Testament, even though we have a king who replaces all kings. Amen? Amen. There were some general stipulations that the kings had to abide by that we find in Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 to 20. And there are several of them, but I just want to highlight uh, two or three that I think are relevant to us right now. And one addresses the fact that we do not want to go back to Egypt. We don't go back to Egypt. We don't go back to where we were to find strength. We don't go back to where we were to, to engage in associations that we were in because it causes us to feel better. We don't go back to where we were. We don't ally with anybody or align with anybody that's not a part of God's will. Amen? The Word tells us so. And the Word says that they shouldn't take many wives. Well, that's not the point of that for us. The point of that for us is that we should not enjoin ourselves to anything, to anything, to anything that causes us to distort the word or pervert the word on our own behalf or that causes us not to completely submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So we, we, may not, we, not, we, we are not to be married to anything that pulls us off track. A third one that applies to us is they were told not to accumulate a lot of wealth, especially right now. We don't need to be involved in things that are so materialistic or that keep us working so hard that we have no time for God. Amen? We need to unencumber ourselves of things that keep us from reading the word, that keep us from serving God, that keep us from even thinking about God, let alone decree or declare what his word tells us to decree or declare or what he could put in our hearts to decree or declare if we made time for him. Amen? Amen. So we don't want to accumulate large amounts of anything, particularly get caught up in materialism or wealth, because not only does it not give us enough time for the Lord, but then things like greed, selfishness, those kinds of things creep in because we get so we like those things and it's difficult to let them go. So those are at least three things related to being kings that I think are key for what's going on today. No distractions. Amen? Amen. Amen. Because we're carriers of the word. We're carriers of his written word if we read it. We're carriers of the prophetic word if we take the time to write it out and we get it in our hearts. And we're carriers of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the living word inside of us. Amen. And let me tell you, all of who he is is ready to come out. Amen. This is the time. This I love, though. What it says of the kings in the Old Testament is when they took the throne... Each king was responsible to write out for himself on a scroll all the words that Moses spoke. That's a lot of writing. They were to go to the Levites, the priests, and get a copy of it. And they were to write for himself, it says, on a scroll, a copy of these laws that are taken from the Levitical priests. And it was to be kept with the king at all times. Every day, and the king was to read it every day. That was so that the king could learn to revere God, have a true reverence for God. And that is something and a place where I think the church still has room to grow, is having a reverence, a true uh, 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 healthy fear of the Lord, a true reverence, not being scared of him, are frightened by him, but respecting him, recognizing who he is and where he sits, that he's the one and the only almighty God and the only one who can change our circumstances. Amen? So if we keep the word in our hearts, then 
our circumstances can change. Let me just end with that. But also, it wasn't just so that the kings could learn to revere the Lord. It was so that they could very carefully follow the words that were in those written laws and, uh, and also to follow the decrees that God made. If we don't keep ourselves in the word right now, with all the perversion of the word that's out there right now, with everybody writing books and distorting it to defend their lifestyle of where they are today and quoting scripture and saying the Bible says this is okay and here are the reasons why we must, we must, we must know what the word says. We can't let the word do what it's supposed to do if we don't even know what the word says. Amen? And we have to steadily stay in the word. Now, there might have been a season where we felt like it wasn't quite so critical, but we have a huge calling right now, and we have a huge role in establishing the kingdom, and we have a huge role in pushing back the hand of the enemy, in pushing back the hand of terror, in pushing back the hand of evil and the heart of evil. And we can't do it if we don't have the word inside of us. Scripture, the prophetic word, Jesus, the living word, amen? If we don't have it, then we will be able to be turned from the right and to the left by all of the subtle changes and the way the word is presented to defend what's going on in the world today, to defend what's going on sexually, to defend abortion, to defend some of what the government does with our money, etc. I mean, there are all kinds of things going on that are ungodly, and we don't have an answer for it. We have the Bible inside of us, but when we're confronted, we don't know what to say. As a church, we don't know what to say. Amen? That's changing. That's changing because we're waking up. This is a time of awakening, a time of celebration for the church because of what God's pouring out. Amen? So those were some three things that I thought were still important for us to think about as those who co-rule with the Lord Jesus Christ. There were some general duties that a king had. He represented God. He was a steward of the nation. And he promoted the exclusive worship of Yahweh. Nobody and nothing else but the exclusive worship of Yahweh. You can look just in this country, and I don't think we could count the number of things or people that are worshipped other than Yahweh. I don't think we can even comprehend that we worship our own life and our own convenience so much that we'll take the life of a child that God's placed inside of us. That's, that is murder. You're exactly right. It's murder. But people play with it. You know, that, and they might even play with it to the extent to say it's not convenient now. And, and I, I wouldn't, I'm not a betting woman. I don't believe in betting. But if I were, I would bet dimes to dollars on this one. That I wouldn't be surprised at all if there are people who are in the ministry that haven't done maybe not that but something similar and said, I've got to do that because it's not convenient because it takes away from my time to minister. Amen? So is there anything that we do in our lives that's not godly because we think that it, it pulls us from having that righteous heart and being a support to someone we see on the street or in our lives who really needs help, but we're too busy. We're too busy maybe even reading the Word, you know? Too busy even reading the Word. And I'm preaching about the Word tonight the importance of the word and letting the word do its work. But even the word should not stand in the way of our righteousness being expressed. Amen? And our love and our compassion being expressed. So we're also priests. Amen? Priests in the Old Testament, those who drew near to God, they offered sacrifices. They ministered in the sanctuary. They taught the law to God's people. They prayed for guidance for the nation. Basically, the bottom line function was to serve God and not serve man. And that hasn't changed for us. We're still to be worshipers. We're still to offer sacrifice. 
we're supposed to be a living sacrifice. So how much greater a sacrifice can we give than to give up all of who we thought we wanted to be and all of our goals and our dreams that we thought were so important to follow the Almighty God, amen? But we can because he's clothed us, clothed, clothed us with a robe of righteousness and he makes it easier for us. And he's filled us with the Holy Spirit who empowers us to do all things, amen? amen. So Levites were careta caretakers of the tabernacle. And they did instruct the people in the law. And it's not different from us. We're carriers of the word. Now, when the church develops the boldness that's coming and the courage that is on the way to an awakened church, then we won't hesitate in public settings to speak the word. I mean, how many times, that's probably not a person in this room that has at one time or another been in a situation where they could have said something within the midst of a circumstance, to say, no, that's not what God would say. Or this is what the Bible says. Is there anybody who's never in their life withheld speaking a word when they could have? Because if you have, I want you to lay hands on me and probably the rest of us. Amen? Amen? Now, this is not condemning. This is showing us who we were, but I'm going to tell you where we're going. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we're still to be gatekeepers. We're supposed to keep out those things from our own hearts, from our own families, from our own city, from our own state, and from our own nation that don't belong here. Amen? We're called to be gatekeepers just like the Levites were. That has not changed. We're still teachers and administrators of the law. Maybe we don't function in that capacity as much as we're going to, but that's who we're called to be. We still have that priestly Levitical function, but there is a rising in the church because of what's going on, a boldness and a courage that's going to come out, as well as a passion for the word and to get the word inside of us and to understand it so that we can respond to the circumstances and not stand there in silence because somebody has educated themselves so much more in the word that they can throw the Greek and the Hebrew at us and tell us, no, this is what the Bible really says when we know that's by our own spirit that that's not right. But let me tell you, Matthew Stevenson at our last conference said that it was time really to take on the, the, on the genius of God. That, you know, if we have problems with the judicial system, then don't just complain. Then let somebody study and become a lawyer. Let them rise up and become a judge. And let me tell you, that is happening in the church and will happen in the church because it's our time. Amen. I want to describe for you just a, for a moment what the kings look like at their best moments in the Old Testament. And in order to do that, I'm going to give you a compilation of all of what are described as the eight best kings did. Because no one king really did it all. Josiah came the closest. So I'm going to look at all of them. Now, the, uh, most, when you look up, kings in the southern kingdom, most sources identify eight good kings. When I look at them, I see two of them as having been mostly good. That's not good enough for me. And it's not good enough for us to just be mostly good and to mostly carry out what God's placed inside of us and to mostly read the word and to mostly operate in power. That's not good enough. We're going to operate in the fullness of what he has for us. So in my mind, there are six, not eight, that I would put in the category of good. Two I would put in amongst the best, and that would be Hezekiah and Josiah. And um, the four remaining, they're good. They were good kings. But here's something that they had in common, although what I'm going to share didn't cut necessarily across all kings. But this would be a compilation of their best attributes if they could have been one king. Amen? What the word says is that they did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Now, when they said did what was right, they tore down altars. They tore down images. They um, got rid of wizards and mediums and sorcerers. They got rid of the idols. What they didn't do was they didn't tear down the high places. The high places. Now, Josiah came the closest 
And he tore down the high places, not only just in Judah, but also in Israel. But they weren't great at tearing down the high places. The high places were the places where sacrifices, including uh, babies, daughters walking through fire, whatever, were made to gods with specific name, Baal, Dagon, etc. Specific gods. They did not tear those down. So although as they were kings were faithful to go about the cities and, and the, the southern kingdom and tear down all the things that you could see, what they didn't totally deal with were the hearts of the people. They didn't change the hearts of the people until we get to Hezekiah and Josiah, and there was a grand effort on that one. So what ended up happening is although they, they, they were trying to do the right thing, they didn't teach anybody. They weren't stewards of the word all of them, until you get to Hezekiah and Josiah, stewards of the word, to change the hearts of the people. So the land stayed wicked, amen? So we can't let that happen. We can't let other things come into our lives, as I said earlier, that we worship, or that we allow and hold higher than, than our almighty God and the Lord Jesus Christ. What they did is those who were good, they went to the temple, and they prayed, and they sought the presence of the Lord. And when there was something that was an issue larger than their own household, they brought in the leaders and the rulers and the people of God so that they all were involved. They made covenant with God at those times, and they swore with their heart and soul to follow God. And a couple of them commanded their people to do the same. But you can't command your people. You can't command your children of those in your sphere of influence, wherever that is, whether it's work, you can't command them to do something if you don't teach them. You can't tell them and expect them to obey and expect a heart change if you don't teach them and if you don't demonstrate that change yourself. It's all for naught. Amen? And they trusted God. They wouldn't go to war, the best of kings, unless they went to the Lord first. They would, the best of kings would seek out a prophet to find out what they should do in a decision. If a prophet came to them, they received that prophet and the word, whether it was negative or positive, with the exception of Asa and one other, but, um, but I'm compiling the best of the attributes. So they would receive the word, whether it was negative or positive. And I love Josiah because, and, and Hezekiah because when the Lord came with a corrective word, they just made more sweeping reforms. They taught more of the word. They made sure that people understood the law, that, that the priests and the Lev Levites understood their identity. They swept out and cleaned out the house of God. And we're, we're a tabernacle. We are the house of the Lord Jesus Christ now. They totally swept it out. We're to totally sweep out ourselves and keep it clean. We still have that function, amen? Because God is on the move, and we are waking up. But if there's sin and there's disobedience, then how can God put in us what needs to be there? Amen? Amen. They were stewards of the nation of the words, as I already said. What I want to get to is we are stewards of God's word. We're someone, someone's who are responsible for the very careful use of this most precious resource that God has given us. His written word, and when we receive a prophetic word, it's a resource. They become weapons. They become things that we can read to know who God is, to remind us of who he is, so that in the worst of circumstances, we remember who our God is, and things are okay because we know who our God is. Our prophetic words remind us of who we are in the eyes of the Lord and what we will accomplish uh, according to God's word, amen? So we can war with these words. We worship because he deserves it, amen? Amen. So we've got to get the word inside of our heart. You know, it's interesting. We're stewards of the word. And um, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 says, this is how you ought to regard us. This is how we want the world to look at us and to regard us as servants of Christ. Not the world, 
Not our job. We do the job as if unto the Lord, not to any other man. We as priests, we serve the Lord our God and the Lord our God only. Amen? He comes first. You ought to regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And again, steward is someone who is, makes careful use of the resources that are given to him. 2 Timothy 1, 13 through 14 says, Hold to the standard of sound words, not the words that, that get watered down, not the distorted or the perverted words, but hold to the standard of sound words that you heard from me and do so with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. Amen? So we're stewards of the word. We're to share the word. We're to teach the word. And it doesn't mean that you have to make it a class. We can drop truth into those we work with without saying, thus saith the Lord. When they're in the tough circumstances, stance, you can just say something like, well, I just sense. If you know them really well, you can say, well, you know, what, what the Lord says about that is. But there are times you can't. But you can sit back and you can listen. And you can ask the Holy Spirit, what needs to be said right here? And you can say it without saying, God said. You just can say, I think what you need to do in this circumstance is this. And you'll be expressing the word of God, his wisdom, and his reason into a circumstance. And I, can, I know that I know from personal experience that they will begin to recognize that when you speak from that place, it's coming from someplace else. And where does it come from? And they will ask you. Why do you always have these wise answers? And if they ask me, I'll tell them where it comes from. I won't push it on them, but I'll say, well, you asked, so I'm going to tell you. Because my purpose is honesty. Amen? Amen. So um, hold to the standard of sound words that you heard from me. Do so with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So we have the word inside of us, and we're in a place and time where we can't hold it in anymore. When we hear the lies and the deception coming forth, we need to be able to speak it. But we need to be able to speak against the lies and into the lives of those who are confronting us with our own biblical standard, but inaccurately, we need to do so with love and with compassion. It does not need to be a verbal battle, because that will get us nowhere and won't take them anywhere good either. Amen? So 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14 goes on to say, protect that good thing entrusted to you. Protect that good thing entrusted to you through the Holy Spirit who lives in you. That to me means that we guard that message because we've got a lot of peddlers out there who are walking around with a false doctrine and a false word. And we need to, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the influence of the Holy Spirit, change that. Amen? We need to stop those words being spoken. Because words have power. Spoken word has power. And if they're speaking deception and an erroneous word, they're speaking curses upon us, not life. And the word is life to us. It's a living word. And it gives us life and it parts life into us. And then we can breathe out life to others. Amen. So we need to protect that good thing. We also need to pass it on. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says, entrust what we have to others. We believe in being reproducers in this house of God and in all things. To re reproduce ourselves, we need to make sure that the word is passed on as well. Pass it on to that next generation of believers. The next generation of believers might be people even older than you who aren't saved yet, but they're the next generation of believers. You know, we had one great commission. That was to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creatures, right? That was Matthew 16, 15, and 16. In Matthew 28, 19, and 20, it says that we're to go and to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I read that that was for all of us. 
So we are entrusted with the mysteries of God, and we're supposed to actively use them just like the kings in the Old Testament did. They didn't read it and care just for themselves. They were to act on it and to use that word. I read a very sad statistic yesterday that said 7% of the church is trained to do the work of evangelism. 2% are actually doing the work. That's a tough one. I don't know how many people are here, 150. I'm not good with that, 250, I don't know. But every one of us can contribute to improving that statistic. And it's what we are to do with the word. Having the word inside of us laying dormant is of no godly use. Amen? Amen. One of the issues with evangelism has been that it hasn't been very effective. Not in the past. Because people, and I, I can remember being trained this way. We learned a formula, which, you know, the Roman road, which scriptures to quote to get them to make a decision. Put that little notch in your belt. Got five people saved this week. But are those five people still saved today? Because it's not enough to bring them to a decision-making point. It's about relationship and discipling people. It's hanging in there with them and teaching them the word so that they don't become lost sheep later. Amen? So that's what we're going to do. Because God is going to increase our passion for it. And there's already an increasing passion around the globe to speak out the word of the Lord and to get people saved, and not just from their horrific circumstances, but from condemnation to hell. Amen? Amen. I'm going to switch gears because I'm, I want to do some things before we have to wrap up. So that's the Great Commission. That's all I'm going to say about that. Is we got to wake up, we got to do it, all right? You going to do it? He's going to do it. All right. Amen. He sees our hands. I want to make a few comments about the armor of God, not the whole armor, because we're talking about the word tonight, about the armor of God. It's very obvious from what's going on in the world that life's a battle. It's hard. Life is hard. It's not one big pleasure boat for sure. It was the same way for Jesus. He began his ministry with a 40-day battle in the wilderness. Amen? He ended his ministry in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, praying and being attacked by the enemy so badly with what he had to go through that he sweat blood. And that's not just something to read in the Bible. That is an actual physiological thing that can happen and only happens under extreme and great duress beyond that which we can even imagine. So I, th I think it was certainly, for me, the, the threat of being crucified might have been a enough to cause me to sweat blood. But I think it also was the battle that was going on with the enemy just coming after him all that time while he was praying to gather the strength to go through what he had to go through. So life's a battle. When Paul went to Ephesus, the first time he went, he was run out of the synagogue by the unbelieving Jewish leaders. He was mimicked by a, um, an exorcist. He was threatened by a guy who made idols out of silver because Paul was bad for business. So it's always a battle when we represent the Lord. And there's two things that stood out to me when I was thinking about this. And one is, goes back to my golf story. So that we're called to resist, first of all, in James 4, 7. And we're called to stand firm. Stand firm. God's our strength. We can apprehend that strength as long as we're in a place of obedience. And we keep our temple clean. Ephesians 10 is where the, the, um, the armor starts, but I'm, I'm going to start a little bit further on into that. It says in um, verse 14, well, verse 13, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, are we in the day of evil? Yeah. We are in the day of evil comes. You may be able to stand on your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. 
14, stand firm then with a belt of truth buckled around your waist. Goes on to say with a breast, breastplate of righteousness, feet fitted with a readiness for the gospel. And in addition, take up the shield of faith. Take the helmet of salvation. This is what we're about tonight. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You know, it's interesting. I was doing some reading on armor. I think it was last year when I, when I gave a word here. And when the, with the Roman armor, there were certain things that were connected. There was the belt of truth. That went on first. And that was important because the belt's important because, you know, they had those robes. And for them to get ready for battle, they had to pull up those robes and tuck them in the belt <laughs> for readiness for battle. Uh, what's also important is that the breastplate of righteousness wasn't something they just put on. It was attached to their belt. So truth and righteousness go hand in hand. If we can't keep truth in us, the true word of God inside of us, how can we maintain our righteousness? I mean, thankfully, the Lord Jesus Christ, we're clothed with righteousness, and we can ask for forgiveness, etc. But it'll be so much easier for, for us to become more like Jesus if we keep our righteousness attached to truth, which is the word. Amen? The other thing that was attached to the belt was the sheath or a scabbard or whatever that held, holds the sword, which is the word. So there's an intimate spiritual connection between the word, the sword, truth, and righteousness. They're all tied together in terms of our protection. So the word becomes so critical to us. The belt, the, the truth part of it is critical to us in our righteousness. The belt also had some other kind of loops or whatever. I don't know how they did it, but some kind of other things on it so that they could attach additional weapons. So when we are walking in truth and when we have the true word of God inside of our hearts and we're walking in the true word of God, that enables God to pour upon us additional weapons of warfare, additional strategies to use coming against the enemy to overcome our circumstances. So sometimes when we're in a circumstance we can't overcome, it's good to ask ourselves, is there anything inside of me that righteousness that's attached to that? Is there anything inside of me that's keeping God, from working through me? Is there anything inside of me, or is there something that I don't have right about the word that's keeping him from pouring additional things upon my belt so that I can have greater power and authority to overcome the enemy? Amen? Amen. Amen. So truth, that word is so important because it is tied to our righteousness and enables us to allow the Holy Spirit to move us to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. That... that um, sword that they talk about, that they put in, it wasn't a huge broad sword, you know, that took two hands to, to, to wing around. You know, it was two-edged so that you could wing in two directions and, you know, cut two heads, cut two heads with, with one swipe. <laughs> However, it was a targeted weapon. If you read about the weapons and the sword that was used in times of battle, it wasn't the huge, huge one. It was a smaller one that yet they used. It was very targeted because it allowed them to get into the little cracks of the enemy's armor. Amen? So that sword, this word, this word, this word, our prophetic words, our prophetic words. The Lord Jesus Christ inside of us, if we'll let him out in full capacity, if we'll get the word out in full capacity, allows us to very targetedly get into the armor of the enemy and get him out of our lives, get him out of our hearts, get him out of the hearts of our children, get him out of our homes, out of our city, our state, and our nation. Amen? So the word, the word, the word. This is the word night. The word, the word. It's critical. I've already said the scripture and the prophetic word, they're living in the active. They're sharper than any two-edged sword. They're so powerful, so powerful. I had a Greek word, a couple Greek words I wanted to share with you. I don't know that they're critical, but let me just share this. Standing firm, 
Standing firm, you know, when you stand for battle, standing firm, of course you're going to stand firm. Stand firm in golf. But this is more important because that word is a Greek word that's a military term. And it means to hold a critical position while you're under attack. So the victory is in that standing firmness. Amen? Which is really leading, living that obedient lifestyle that enables us to stand firm. So it's a military term. We can't continue to stand firm without the word, the word, the word. Amen? The belt of truth is also a Greek word. It refers to the content to make sure that the content is true. All right? But it has a secondary meaning. And that is that it can also refer to an attitude or a quality of truthfulness. So we need to know the truth of the content. We need to deliver it with an attitude of truthfulness. We need to be able to be trustworthy so that when the word is delivered, that it can be received. Amen? Amen. That's all I'm going to say about that. So now I'm going to wrap up. It's a short one. I'm going to do some things. Daniel Webster said that if we abide in the principles that are taught in the Bible, our country will go on prospering. But if we neglect its instruction and authority, no man can tell how sudden a catastrophe may overturn us and bury our glory in profound obscurity. That's the effort of the enemy today. But I'm saying, are we going to commit to rise up in the word tonight? In the word of truth? And to commit to use that word of truth? There's no reason on earth why that should happen in this country. Not when we have as many in this country who represent what you represent sitting in this room. Amen? Amen. Andrew Murray uh, was a Dutch Reformed uh, church missionary to uh, South Africa. And he said, this is important. He said, earthly authority cannot be exercised within the will of God. Our earthly authority cannot be exercised within the will of God without, without the application of prayer on the part of people. Amen? The people of God is what he said. So I'm sharing that quote just to say, it doesn't matter if you know how to declare and decree right now. It doesn't matter if your history is you haven't spent enough time in the Word. It doesn't matter if you have a problem with your memory because my Bible tells me that the Holy Spirit will bring things to remembrance to me. But he can't bring things to remembrance to me if I haven't put them inside of me. Amen? But it doesn't matter where you are right now. But you can pray. I don't care how spiritual you've been. We can all pray. We can all pray the truth of God's word. We can get on our knees and we can cry out on behalf of our families and cry out on behalf of this nation. We don't have to be, you know, the most spiritual person in the room, the most well-read academic biblical scholar. We can pray. Amen? We can open our Bibles if we don't know what it says and find words that agree with what God wants to do. And we can read those words out loud. Amen? I'm... I'm encouraging you to pray out loud and let the enemy hear your words. If we pray silently, God knows what we're thinking, but the enemy does not. When we war, we want to be vocal. We want to use words, words, words. Tonight is about words. Amen? Thank you, Lord. And now I want to share just two more things. One is that, out of something you said to me, Jeannie, if I have, I do have it. This is encouraging to me. Then I'm going to give you a resource. Jane Hammond gave a word last year. She's always given a word. They're always awesome. This one I copied and just put in my notebook that I use when I come and do something like this. She had a dream, uh, I think it was last August, for the church. And it was a dream of awakening and revival. This is the season we are in church, awakening and revival. And she dreamed about four horsemen. This is what we're getting. This is what God is trying to pour out on us right now. Now, right now, in the midst of our circumstances. The first horseman was a horseman who worked with um, 
recent moves of God and past revivals and outpourings in the charismatic movement. And the bottom line of that was it's a catch-up anointing. So those anointings that haven't been present for a season, all those anointings that came out and all the previous revivals, God is bringing back today and pouring them out in greater measure all at once, not one anointing at a time, at one revival at, an, at a time, but the full complement of the anointing of all revivals being poured out in this season to empower us to operate. The second horseman was an angel that worked with the prophetic movement. And we know from Psalm 29 that the, that, that the prophetic voice is a powerful, vo powerful voice and a powerful force. If you don't know how powerful it is, read Psalm 29 because it will tell you everything. But, um, uh, and that horseman represents a fresh wind of revelation coming, but a revelation coming with a new power to the prophetic people. People who press in to hear God's voice. doesn't mean you have to be a prophet. It just means that you pray. You, listen, you pray. And you also listen to what God's saying when he speaks to you. Thank you Lord. And it says that more people are going to become, to embrace and become trained in hearing God's voice. And that's happening. I mean, we have John Eckhart running all over the country now, you know, doing um, Activation for America. I mean, it, it's happening all over. This word is happening right now. If you haven't involved yourself in a training to hear the voice of the Lord, do so. Do so. Do it wherever it's occurring. It happens here. There are schools you can find out online. If we're not close to you, go somewhere. John Eckhart's coming back in another week, I think, to, in uh, Tucker, or Tucker, or Tucker, I think it is, in Tucker. Go to a workshop. It'll change your life. It will change your life. Um... And it says that a whole new prophetic wave is being released. Those of us who have been doing this for 30 years, we can feel it. We talk about it. Oh, Jeannie, we talk, there's something different. You know, it's the excitement that we felt when it first occurred, when for the very first time, and it had never happened before in our lives, in our lifetimes. There's an excitement in a new wave. So those of you who haven't been involved, get involved. That fourth horse, horseman, uh, was an angel that had to do with evangelism. And unfortunately, it was called the new kid on the block. The new kid on the block. When the word tells us to go out and preach to every living creature, the new kid on the block, evangelism. But what the word wanted to impress was that God is stirring and putting in us a boldness to speak his word and an urgency that we haven't felt before to reach those that are lost within our sphere of influence. We can't save the whole world, but we work with the unsaved, don't we? We may even have some unsaved friends. I don't know. But we all have a sphere of influence. Those four angels in this dream walked arm in arm. So it's not like, what's your name? It's not like, Jen, you're just going to get... Prophecy, what's your name? April, you just get evangelism? Lexi, you get all the stuff from the past, but nothing from the future. It's not that way. We're going to get it all now. A full synergy. We, don't, we can't even comprehend the dose of authority and power and anointing. And on top of that, the miraculous. I mean, the miraculous. We're not going to just evangelize with just a word in a Roman road in, anymore. This time we go out like the disciples with signs and wonders and healings and miracles. It's starting to happen and it will grow. Just don't let your faith drop. Amen? Have a faith for everything the Bible says has happened and will do. Amen? All right. I'm going to stop right there. I just want to say one more thing. And it's not long. It's not. I'm coming in for a landing. It's, I really have landed. And now I want to give you a resource. All right? I've landed. Apostle Buddy gave us a book yesterday. It's called Well Versed Biblical Answers to Today's Tough Questions. And this is a book that, by description, will equip us to respond confidently with truth, the truth. 
the truth our nation so desperately needs. There's hundreds of topics in here. So for if you don't know how to respond when there's discussion going on, this is a great starting point, is to get a book like this to get this book. It will help us. The author is James L. Garlow. Now, I did ask at the meeting yesterday if we could have copies of this book in the bookstore tonight. I, the bookstore has been is closed before the, before the end of the service, so I don't know if they got here. But please check the bookstore before you leave to see if they are here because this book costs $14.99 on the market, $20 if you're in Canada. But you can get them here tonight for $10, $10, all right? We want you to have a starting point. You may not all need it. Some of you, though, this, won't, this is what this book won't do. I know some families are wrestling with one particular issue. I mean, if your spouse comes to you and tells you that she or he is gay, that's one issue. You need to know more probably than what this book is going to tell you about how to deal with that. So you're going to read about that area. How, how do I handle it? How do I speak truth? You know, how do I do that with love and compassion? So, but this is a great starting point, amen? So I want to leave you with that resource and then I want us to do a couple things. Amen? Amen. Everybody good? Yeah. All right. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for truth. Amen? So I just pray in the name of Jesus that we be a people who can let the word of God and all that that means, Lord, your written word, your prophetic word, and the Lord Jesus Christ, that we can let the word do its work. And that we can let the Lord Jesus Christ rule in our lives in such a way that we can rule, co-rule with him effectively so that we can have an impact in his kingdom. Amen? Right now, in the name of Jesus, I just declare, I decree from the word of God that every one of your family members that has been assigned by Satan to the pit of hell, we pull out this night in Jesus' name. We pull out our family members. We place them in the palm of God's hand. And we say, God, just if this person tries to run away from your kingdom, squeeze them, Lord. Squeeze them to life, Lord. Not to death. Squeeze them to life. So right now, in the name of Jesus, those battles that you have been fighting, Lord well, says, let them go and let the word do the work. Don't pray just from your heart. Now you speak the word over it, and then you let it go because then it's in God's hand, and you move on to your next assignment and to your next circumstance and your next battle. Amen? All right, everybody stand. I want everybody to stand. Everybody stretch. Everybody find a partner. If, if, I'm, if we're uneven, just find a... Get in triples, I don't care. Because we're going to start with praying first. All right, everybody have a somebody or somebody's? First thing I want you to do is I want you to take a moment. Just take a moment, both of you, I mean, or all of you if you're two or three. And just take a moment and ask God, God, what would you have me pray for our nation right now? What would you have me pray? And just take a moment and let him speak to you. Amen. Now, shorter of the two, I want, if you're the same height, then the, the, the best looking, <laughs> or the, the bolder of the two, I want you to, want the shorter of the two, or however you decide to pray, and I want you to pray where you feel God has just told you to pray over our nation, however he gave it to you, amen, and begin.
Amen. And now taller of the two, you go ahead and you pray what the Lord showed you to pray and begin. Amen. Amen. And now let's get personal. Not too personal. I want you to think about a circumstance in your life that um, you want victory over right now. A simple example, this is a simple one, could be maybe you have a child who's sick. We're not going to pray over it. We're going to make commands. They're called decrees, all right? When we decree something, when we make a command that lines up with God's heart and his word and will, then it's like a law that has to be obeyed. The enemy has to obey it as long as um, we're standing in righteousness. Amen? So if you need to say a quick prayer of righteousness or confess a couple little sins, and go ahead and do that first, all right? <laughs> but, but, for example, if you have a sick child, I don't want you to pray and ask God to heal them. What I want you to do is say, sickness, leave my child right now in the name of Jesus. Let healing come to my child. Let perfect health and perfect healing come to my child. No disease, no infirmity will affect my life's child. You hear the difference in praying versus just telling the enemy to basically get out of your territory? So I want you to think of something that's in your life that's personal, but not something that you're not willing to decree out loud toward. Shorter of the two, I want you to begin to do that. I want you to command the enemy uh, in an appropriate way, depending on what your circumstance is, to get out, to get out of that circumstance, to leave that circumstance alone, and then release the opposite of that in it. If it's sickness, then it's health, all right? And i start with the shorter of the two. And you don't have to share what it is. I think it'll be clear when you begin to just decree, all right? Shorter of the two. Do a little work on your own behalf, whatever that circumstance is, and begin. Amen, and taller of the two do the same. Amen, amen, and amen. You may be seated. 
and Lola, would you come up here, please? Daryl, would you come up here, please? And Brian, is Brian in the house tonight? I saw him earlier. Okay. All right, then we'll, you guys will work. All right, Brian. How many of you have never been to a school for prophetic teams or uh, training or whatever? We've got, we've got a fair number tonight. Um, I'm going to, these are people who are on our teams, our team leaders. They've gone through schools, they're well trained, whatever. And um, I could do this, but sometimes people will look at you and say, well, you know, you're a prophet and you're doing the whatever. So, uh, so of course you can do that. But these are people who have been through our school. For those of you who haven't been, I have them up here to be an encouragement to you to learn to hear the voice of the Lord. I'm going to ask each one of them to give a word in a certain area that they, had, they, don't, they didn't know they were going to do this. So this is, they're just up here, okay, in a certain area. And I'm going to ask them to keep it short because we need to be out of here in two minutes, all right? Or, so which, which is a hard thing to do. But what I want you to focus in on is, is the anointing, the power, and the authority of the word, all right? Because this is who you are. And this is who you will be when you learn to hear the voice of the Lord in your practice in it. Amen. And this is how you can war. So what I'm going to do is you guys will get rolling. I'm just going to pat you because this is just a demonstration. All right? All right. All right, um, Brian, I want you to give a word against racism. And we decree to the mountains of racism that you will come down in the name of Jesus. Uh, we break the systematic racism that has been founded in this government and the innocent blood of those will no longer cry out, but we raise a standard against racism. We decree and declare that the Ku Klux Klan and every other systematic racism cult uh, will no longer have ability to function in this territory or any other territory. It's hard to stop him, isn't it? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to stay on schedule, though. I'm committed. I would like Lola to give a word um, in the area of child trafficking. And the Lord says that this is the time that I'm beginning to expose even those barons that have been moving in the tra child trafficking business. I'm going to begin to cause their wells to go dry. I'm going to begin to move and I'm going to begin to raise up the judicial system to begin to cause them to pay for their sins. And even those children that their minds have been messed up, I am releasing deliverance and healing. And I'm not just raising evangelists, I'm raising and deliverers. Amen. Amen. Daryl, I want you to speak into the area of injustice. Rise up, my children. This is a time to begin to be bold and to stand out because those things that you begin to cry out for, know that I've heard your cry and I, I've heard the cry of this, this society over the brokenness, over the hurt and bitterness. Know that I'll begin to war on your behalf even as you begin to stand out on the authority that I've given you because many of you have st stayed back and you walked in fear, but know that I'm calling you out to step out in faith in the boldness that I gave you to begin to take authority that I've given you in your lips and know that I'm going to connect you even with people that care about those things so know that I'm destroying the works of darkness of injustice amen thank you team hallelujah all right you may be seated all right that was a demonstration to encourage those of you who are new to the prophetic to um, have a demonstration of how powerful the word can be inside of you I did it also for a second reason Tonight is Presbytery Night. Many of you will be getting a word, will be receiving a word. I don't want you to be remiss in writing that word out and getting it in your heart. We have the written word we can go to.
That's one of our instructions when we receive a, a, a prophetic word is write that word out. I mean, if a king could write out everything that Moses had to say, we surely can write out a word. Amen? And you read that word and you get it in your heart. So if the word tells you something like, you're going to be successful in business, and you're thinking, I've never even set my hand in business. The enemy is going to surely, as soon as you leave this door, say, that's not true about you. You're not able to. And you fight back. You say, no, my God said. You write that word out. My God called me out by name, and he said, amen. Amen. I'm turning it over. Made it right on time. There you go. Hallelujah to the minute. Thank you, Lord. Um, 